to talk to you all about how I got started and, and why I chose the path of, I guess, starting out with the Appalachian chair. And I, I had been an artist since I was eight, I guess, or at least considered myself an artist uh, and certainly on track to become a professional artist. But about the time I was 20 years old, I started getting discouraged about that and was in the public library and ran across a book called The Foreign Art of Cabinet Making by James Krenov and was fascinated by the way he talked about using wood as an art medium and using the grain instead of a paintbrush to create the picture that he envisioned on the surface of his cabinets. And I was really inspired by that and excited about the possibility of doing something so much more physical than the painting and drawing that I had been accustomed to. So I started playing around with a few basic tools and looking more about what might be involved in setting up to be an exploratory woodworker. And I came up with my best guess as to what it would cost to set up a shop like Krenov's around 10 grand, and that was back in the early 80s, around 80, probably about 1980, 81. So I started getting a little bit discouraged by that, but um, still thinking there's, there's gotta be a way to get into it. it wasn't until I ran across uh, Jane, Jenny Alexander's book, Make a Chair from a Tree, that I actually found on my dad's coffee table. Uh, I borrowed it, I don't think I ever returned it. But what was fascinating to me about that book is that while Jenny didn't talk about woodworking in the same voice that James Krenov did, he did talk about grain in more of a structural way that I could really relate to. And with design, not directly but indirectly in a more sculptural way and related it to the human body, which I really connected with. So. The, the big thing, though, that really got me switched into chair making versus thinking I would start off with something square and rectilinear uh, was the fact that I could set up shop for 50 bucks. And John was, Jenny was really intent on keeping the focus simple and inexpensive and accessible to pretty much everyone and did a beautiful job of that because it was a very inviting way to get into woodworking. So I read his book several times and got a draw knife and started playing around with some pieces of wood and built a really bad uh, shaving horse out of some old fence plank that I got from my dad's farm. But it got me by and I found a piece of, uh, oh, it was about a three foot long sassafras log that was a good one to start on when it smelled really great. But also it split easily, it was soft, easy to work with, didn't make great chairs but it was a great first, I guess, practice wood to start with. And I, I got really excited about it because it was so easy to work with. I'd never been able to get that kind of productivity from a hand plane or any of the processes that I could avail myself to in Krenov's approach. It wasn't long before I found myself at a log yard buying a log, and my first ones were this log here. Uh, this was one of two hickory logs that I bought. They were 350 years old, 32 foot logs, both of them just straight as a gun barrel. And I bought them for 10 cents a board foot delivered. And the, the logger felt bad for me. He said, just pay me when you get some money. And that, that was my start. So <clears throat> I went from sassafras to hickory, sort of one extreme to the other. But that was some beautiful working hickory and being able to split the wood out of the log and smell it and feel it and, and get the sense of fibers separating did so much to, I guess, ingrain in me a sense of the material. And that's been really key to how I think about everything that I design, even though I work very differently now. But the way I built this chair, it pretty much exactly to uh, Jenny Alexander's recipe, splitting every piece out, shaving it, there's no turning here. These, even the tenons I carved with a uh, draw knife. I didn't have a spoke shave at that time, I couldn't afford one. In fact, I didn't have a chisel, I used a sharp screwdriver to cut these mortises. Uh, 
this was the only chair I did that way. I, I did get a little bit of money and I bought a hardware store, uh, just funky little chisel. It was a little bit better than a screwdriver, not much. But just like uh, in Alexander's book, I went and uh, cut a tree down, stripped the bark, made it into splints, and uh, wove the seat. And I, I think this chair probably took me two weeks to three weeks to build. But more importantly than how long it took was it, and more importantly than building a chair, what I was building was a foundation on which all of my woodworking rested or grew from. And that was not only the understanding of the material by splitting the wood out, but by using the greenwood technique of dry parts as rung, slightly damp parts as legs, everything shrinking together and locking up over time. And being able to work with the wood through its drying process gave me a sense of exactly how its behavior changed and how its character and quality changed from wet to dry. And what was and, and by making these joints work without glue really helped me understand the importance of moisture content and how to take advantage of it and how it will really ruin a project if you don't pay attention to it. So after making chairs about, I guess I made 300 without any power tools with just that $50 tool kit. Gradually I, I got a scraper and a spoke shave. My grandfather felt sorry for me, bought me a $12 Kunst spoke shave. Uh, it was a horrible thing, but uh, it, it did introduce me to tools, or spoke shaves. So anyway, I, I did the steam bending, put it together just like John said, and, and I was real pleased with how it came out because it was a reasonably good sitting chair on my first effort. I started playing with the, getting the technique a little bit better and pretty soon started playing with the design a little bit just to kind of make it my own. And so I built this one in 1982. 20 years later, my chair started looking like this. Uh, one of the things I had wanted to do uh, when I started was to learn from a chair maker, and there really weren't very many. There was one chair maker in our area that worked in this fashion, and he was pretty crude in his process. Uh, who I really wanted to learn from was Dave Sawyer. And in 1985, I got a chance to do that, but Dave had already switched over to making Windsor chairs. And so I, I'd already decided I wanted to learn from him whatever he was making, so I learned how to make Windsor chairs. I wanted to incorporate some of the angles that I really liked in Windsor's, and so these legs splay back and out to the side, just five degrees here, 12 out to the back. I experimented with different angles and found that after 12 degrees, it starts to get difficult to get assembly without cracking the leg, or maybe it's drilling a straight hole that's at that angle. But the more angle I was putting on the drill bits I had at the time, the more they would tend to creep into a non-cylindrical shape. So 12 degrees worked out good. And it, and it was a good balance, I think, visually. Another thing that I added to the designs as I got better at steam bending is I added a slight recurve. There's a little bit of a thoracic curve here. It wasn't a perfect back shape, but it did add a little bit more comfort and a, a higher support for your back. By the time I'd gotten to this one, uh, I had designed and built a bark machine that would make the splints. So the, the splints are much, much more uniform in this chair. Um, I, I did cheat and started using matching wood for the legs and rungs. It's not ideal structurally, but I didn't have very many problems with the, the cherry. And in here, this the, the rails on the sides were always either uh, hickory, oak, or sugar maple so that I would have enough strength here with that 5 8 inch dowel. So by this time, I was also using machine tools these joints are cut with a router and a, and a jig, but still 
hand carved pins that lock the slats in, but at this point my uh, my joints were precise enough that I was getting a glue bond in, in Alexander's early chairs and, and the way I did my early chairs. Uh, he didn't consider this an important part of the structure. The structure was all down here. These legs held the slats, but the slats didn't impart much structure to the frame of the chair itself. In mine, the slats are a little bit thicker. They're bent and set before assembly and this joint then becomes a pretty strong glue bond. It's just a straight, uh, you know, a, a traditional tenon where all the, the facets are, or faces are parallel to each other. Uh, <clears throat> just like the old chairs, I also uh, still keep the grain orientation in mind. So all that the slats are quarter sawn, so the medullary rays are parallel to the faces, keeping the movement or the conflicting movement to a minimum here. What I've done in doing that is minimize by about half the amount of shrinking and swelling of this slat every time the weather changes. And because the leg doesn't change its length, we want this orientation of the slat to be as stable and as in compliance with the leg's movement as it can be. And that's taken through all of the joints. So. All of the legs have growth rings going around the chair, just like they did in the tree, so that the movement is equal on all sets of rungs. And then for all horizontal pieces, slats and rungs included, the growth rings are parallel to the ground, so that the vertical faces are all radial, or what a lot of people will call quarter sawn. So what this chair relies on, just like the earlier chair, is a round tenon, which in a lot of ways is not the ideal joint. There's a lot of ingrain exposure in this joint, so you're needing to bond the ingrain of that leg to side grain of the tenon. But this joint has proven to work for centuries, and when used in conjunction with proper grain orientation, really good glue management, precision of fit, then it, it can definitely work and it's proven by my chairs and, and lots of chairs done by our ancestors. Here I've got a uh, about a one and a quarter inch long tenon that, that fills most of this area. It's a three-eighths tenon and that's pierced by a stepped tenon here. This one and an eighth inch tenon here steps down to a smaller tenon about the size of my finger and pierces this, the tenon of the side rail. So that's a locking joint there. And these chairs worked well. So about four years ago, I decided it was time to rethink my chair making. I wanted to do some kind of an improvement with this chair, but after building these for 25 years, I'd learned a lot about woodworking that I wasn't really applying to this design. I was improving things in the details and in the quality of the work, but the design remained stagnant for a, at least 20 years, maybe 25. And I thought, it's, it's time to, to do something. I really want to make the best ladder back I can possibly make, and what it, would it be like? What form would it have? And how can I take everything I learned from James, from, from the Krenov inspiration that I started out with, Jenny Alexander's book, and the hundreds of chairs I've made since then. I started rethinking and drawing and came up with a completely new concept for a chair, and I'd like to introduce you to that. Its name is Chio. Because this chair has so many unique features, we thought we'd, we'd uh, take another stab at the Good Design Award. We've won it, we've applied twice and won that award twice. A little bit more about that on our website, but uh, we sent pictures of this in, a description of what it's about, and this guy won the Good Design Award, and it also has earned a patent uh, for the design. So that's, that's kind of cool stuff. It's, it's hard to make a truly new chair out of wood now, but uh, it appears we've done it. So this chair solves all of the concerns that I had that I wanted to improve with my traditional or classic 
ladder back, which we now call the Berea chair because that's where I designed it. For one thing, I've entirely eliminated the understructure. That's made unnecessary because of the strength of the joints here. What I've got here, this is the most massive part of the chair, and it, this leg houses two and a half tenons that are oak. Now what you're seeing is all cherry here. What's inside here is a sawn oak rail with a cherry veneer that's about an eighth of an inch thick on the outside. This, this part of the leg houses a two and a half tenon joint, more, two and a half mortise and tenon. It's cut in here, and then there are two tenons inside here that are taper locking oak tenons that come out of this rail. They're quarter sawn oak, keeping the grain, as I was telling you before, parallel to keeping the medullary rays parallel to the long grain of the leg. Same kind of slats, essentially, and that they're quarter sawn and they're bent this way. But to make it more comfortable so that you couldn't hardly feel where one slat ends and the next begin, what I did was bent each slat in two planes. In other words, you can see the curve of this leg. The slat is bent to the curve of this leg across its width. And these lower slats bend in the other way across their width. And that means that the joint itself, all of these mortises curve so that the entire back is as close to the shape of a human torso as I could possibly make it with a ladder back chair. Another thing that, I, that I've done is, as I'm doing with pretty much all of the furniture we're making now, is where we've got a mortise and tenon, it is a taper locking mortise and tenon, so that this, the tenon on the end of this slat is cut to a perfect six degree taper, and the mortise is cut to a curved six degree tapered uh, dimension so that this fits perfectly into that. It, it does make the chair a lot less forgiving to build because you can't adjust the slats relationship to each other uh, like you can in the traditional, traditional ones. They have to fit and bottom out perfectly in their relationship to each other. But after making so many hundreds of chairs, um, we can pull that off now. So the, the back uh, is a little bit more bent. There's a little bit more of a thoracic curve and it's much more precisely oriented to the way that our backs are shaped. And I wanted, I wanted a wooden seat that was shaped, but I didn't want to add the weight that a wooden seat typically adds. And I know from my experience with Windsor chairs, unless I'm going to paint it, I'm not going to sell a pine seat. And in fact, we used to, used to offer um, spruce seats on our Sonus chairs, and those were not popular at all. Everybody wants a hardwood seat. That adds a lot of weight. So <clears throat> I was used to having my chairs weigh about nine pounds or, or so, and I didn't want to mess that up. I wanted to have a lightweight seat, so I, I experimented with, a, with an airplane wing type construction, sort of a torsion box idea. But that meant that we had a, a veneer on top and that had to be applied afterwards. And there were just a myriad of construction issues with that. But it just occurred to me one day that if I could, in, if I could have a, like a fiberglass uh, construction in the seat and veneer that, we could, there's, there's a way to make that happen and make a really lightweight seat. But I didn't know how to do that, so I had to experiment quite a bit. And it was a tremendous investment in, I guess, a design odyssey, you can say. So I don't want to show you the bottom of this one. This was one of the first ones, and, it, and it's not beautiful on the bottom. But I brought a more recent one here. This is the bottom of the seat of a rocking chair. And what you're looking at here is a fiber mesh of linen. That's just like the clothes you wear, it's, it's, it's the plant. Linen is, a, is the strongest plant that we, that we grow, that humans grow. And it's actually the oldest plant that was ever cultivated. 
Um, but this is a composite of linen, which we make from the raw fiber itself. Had some tucked away under here. This is the raw fiber. You can see how it is here. There's nothing holding this together. It's not woven. It's sewn together. And this is biaxial so that this, this surface, all the fibers run this way. And the other surface, the fibers all run this way. So it has kind of a plywood-like effect, but it's incredibly strong. In fact, carbon, or, uh, linen composite is replacing uh, carbon, fiber or carbon fiber in a lot of high-end manufacturing. Uh, motorcycles, jets, boats, uh, and some cars are using it. Uh, I know BMW has a, well, they're using hemp fiber. What this allows from a design perspective is unlike the bending of wood, this stuff can deform in any shape and it's pure fiber. There's no knots, there's no voids, there's no gum or anything. It's pure strength. And what we're using to bond this with is an epoxy that's made from tree resin. So we're basically able to in some ways go back to the way I originally worked, splitting the fibers of the wood apart and then gluing that, that together in, in joinery, this way the fibers are completely separated and we're able to glue it into whatever form we want. Now this particular form is extremely difficult to work, but one of the things that's actually in some ways comical and I think really cool is that linen fiber uh, that we make our clothes out of and that the composite is made out of is actually made from the redded linen bark. So in a way, I'm back to making bark seats, which is, is comical. What I've got here is a layer of veneer, in this case, cherry. And then in the middle here, it's only an eighth of an inch thick. The cherry veneer is about half of that. And then I've got a, a layer of biaxial linen. And then there's another veneer in here and another layer of biaxial linen. And so the top layer of linen, you can see it right here. It's filling in this space. It comes all the way out to the edge. And then there's a bottom one here. So the linen wraps this whole thing, bonding this whole joint area together. And what's awesome about that is that the way woodworking joinery is traditionally designed, and even in here, is this is a double tenon. It's a taper locking tenon. But wherever you've got a tenon, you're you're grabbing, in this case, this rail is grabbing the leg by the inside, but more toward the middle. Now, a double tenon spreads that out, but the stress on any part or the, or the relationship between any part, the stress always starts at the surface. So if you could bond this surface together like welded steel, then you would have a much, much stronger joint here than if you just bonded it in the middle with a tenon. So this double layer of linen here is just creating an incredibly strong bond because it's surrounded this whole joint area holding it together. Now you can see, I think even on the camera, that this is oak here and cherry here. Now what's going on inside here is different. This is one of our frames. This is the upside of it. So we've got, in this case, cherry on the outside, oak in here, and then white pine just to create the shape that we need without adding weight. The rear rail is just cherry and white pine. And then these are oriented so that the grain of the tenons is parallel, or the, or the grain of the rail is parallel to the tenons for maximum strength. You can't, it's difficult to do that in, in a wooden, a carved wooden seat. So it has to be designed a little bit differently, but this way taking all these pieces apart and putting them back together in the strongest way possible gives me the ability to make a lightweight seat that's just phenomenally strong. Even though with this gap here, that's not really doing anything because the strength is over is transferred around here. This is just holding the composite out so we can make a complete shape. And then this joint in the corner in the rocking chairs 
pretty much straight up Maloof, except that it is a taper locking Maloof hip joint in a tapered angled sima curve or a converging two, two converging sima curves. So it's a, it's a little bit of a trick to cut and get accurate, but we, we manage that. Another thing that, that's, that was a big challenge with this is making these parts, once, even once we got this whole thing glued up, being able to make this part, which is two curves that converge, the sima curves, and then a flat section, they've gotta be exactly the same shape symmetrically to the one across. And that's where the bandsaw control comes in. With all of that story about, about this chair, I think that this chair represents, at least for us, the state of the art of chair making, uh, using everything that I know about chairs to make the best ladder back chair possible. So what we're doing now is, is taking that same concept and we're, we're integrating into other designs. Uh, now we're working on one with a vertical slat. We've also got one, uh, a padded version of this coming up. So, but for now, uh, it's complicated enough. So I hope you enjoyed that kind of walkthrough about what our chairs are about, why we do it this way, and how important ergonomics is to us and how we integrate that into design.